So next I would like to invite up Sarah Gunther and Maur Cabral to speak about resourcing intersex activism. I have to say that this looks very much at the Oscars, you know, that we are going to announce something. Uh, okay. Uh, so, intersex people are born with sex characteristics that vary from both male and female standards. We are routinely subjected during infancy, childhood, and later in life to normalizing procedures, including medically unnecessary and consented surgical interventions which have irreversible consequences, as probably you know, including serialization, insensitivity, chronic pain, and trauma. All around the world, in, uh, there are intersex activists, including amazing activists in this conference, producing uh, human rights victories at the national, the, the regional, and the international level. Because truth is that maybe we can't change what happened to us in, you know, in an early life, but we can't afford to leave uh, the world unchanged. So we're gonna tell you now about uh, some research that we did to get a better understanding of how intersex activists are doing their work and how that work is being funded. So in 2013, GATE and AJWS did a survey of trans and intersex organizations and the funding available for their work. Only 10 intersex groups responded to that survey, probably because we did not do very good or targeted outreach to intersex groups and there was not an intersex organization involved in the survey then. This year in 2016, GATE, AJWS, and this time, the new Intersex Human Rights Fund at the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice set out to survey trans and intersex groups again. This time we fielded two separate surveys, recognizing of course that the trans movement and the intersex movement are separate movements. And this time we received responses from 54 intersex groups. So big thank you to all the intersex activists in the room for taking the time. The survey was online and available in five languages, Russian, Chinese, French, Spanish, and English. And while we'll be releasing the full report in 2017 and are still doing some data analysis, we've done some preliminary findings and are happy to share them with you now. So of those who answered the survey, about two in five were from Europe, just over one six from North America, and the same number were from Asia. Just over one in 10 were from South, South Saharan Africa or the Pacific Islands, Australia and New Zealand. And unfortunately, there were insufficient, insufficient respondents to report region-specific statistics from Latin America, which is really sad for me, being a Latin American activist, the Caribbean, North Africa, and the Middle East. This, and I want to be very clear about that, uh, doesn't mean that intersex organizing is not happening in these regions, especially when it comes to be about Latin America. About um, nine in 10 groups who took the survey were autonomous groups. In other words, it means that not projects or programs, they were not projects or programs of another groups. This is positive as a result. Um, the strength to which intersex activism is intersex led and it's something that we really want to address as a very positive outcome only half were registered with the governments. And this not only shows the diversity of ways in which intersex groups are organized, but it also means that intersex activists could be funding some, some uh, barriers in, in access um, uh, to funding uh, for governments that, that often require uh, reg registration. Two thirds of groups working on intersex issues had intersex people making financial decisions. Nearly two thirds of the group that responded to the survey say that more than 50% of the people who made financial decisions for the group were intersex, which is really great. But you know, you need to, con to know that this is the only metric of leadership that the report is showing. So the full report will also look at the strategic and programmatic decisions, who represents the work externally, et cetera. And so we can expect more nuances analysis to come from the full report. 
So now, funding. It's extremely clear that intersex organizing is happening with very limited resources. More than 60% of intersex groups have a budget of less than US $5,000. So a majority of intersex groups are working with less than $5,000 for their work. Only 11 groups in the world have a budget of 10,000 or greater. And about one in five have absolutely no budget at all. So while intersex activists are doing incredible work and more organizing than ever at local, national, regional, and global levels, they are doing this with next to no support. This means two things. One, that intersex activists are really constrained in the work that they're doing. So imagine how much more progress and change could be happening if intersex activists actually were able to hire staff and to resource their own activism. And it also means that there are really serious consequences in terms of burnout, wellness issues, and lack of sustainability. This picture cannot stay the same. A more positive trend is that foundation funding, while limited, is growing. So we found that just under half of intersex groups had received foundation funding between 2014 and 2016. And we're pretty sure that if we did this survey five years ago, the picture would have looked very different. This is largely because of the establishment of the Intersex Fund at Estrella and the resources that we've collectively been able to raise and re-grant to intersex activists. But as you could see from the slide uh, before, it is deeply not enough. There are real opportunities for funders and allies to step up and support the movement. So in conclusion, uh, and on the very positive side, the data demonstrate that the intersex movement is growing across the world, that the majority of groups have intersex people in the key leadership and in decision-making roles, and the most groups as autonomous organizations operating independently. On sort of the negative side of this data, we know that despite this progress, most groups operate with limited budget and financial support for intersex groups continue, uh, continues to be bleak. And the key word here, I would say, is the gap. <laughs> there is a significant gap between the funding available and the funding that is needed. And groups continue to face barriers to accessing the resources required to grow and meet the needs of their communities. So two key recommendations that we want to leave you with. One, donors should increase and strengthen their support, especially of intersex-led organizations, and especially with flexible funding, so intersex activists can invest in their own capacities, strategies, agendas, as the movement is growing. And like Mauro said, we really stress that funding should go to groups that are led by and for intersex people. Foundations who are new to intersex grant making could consider adding intersex groups to their regional portfolios. You saw that there are intersex groups in, in almost every region of the world. They can consider adding intersex groups to their thematic portfolios. So LGBTI rights, human rights, children's rights, disability, women's rights, there are a lot of intersections to explore. And they can also consider contributing to pooled funds like the Intersex Fund at Estrella. Donors and allies should also support the growing intersex movement by providing more spaces for coordination and movement building and supporting opportunities for capacity building and leadership development. So a full report of the data collected through the intersex organizations and, and funding survey will be available in 2000. <laughs> 17. Before Haven kicks us off the stage, um, check out the Estrella's uh, We Are Real report that has more information and recommendations from intersex activists. And please connect with the many intersex activists who are here at ILGA and can tell you more about their work. Thank you. Thank you very much.